so uh, let's start again. So yesterday I introduced uh, minimal structures and uh, I stated uh, some results in Hodge theory. So uh, the goal today is to give the proof of uh, the two first results, namely uh, definability of uh, uh, those arithmetic quotients and uh, definability of period maps. But uh, before doing this, uh, I want to uh, fix some details that were not explained yesterday. So I will start with some remarks on polarization because they will play an important role uh, today. So some remarks. Just to fix notations. So suppose that uh, you have uh, VZ, uh, Z hot structures of weight N, as defined yesterday. And then uh, the definition uh, of a polarization uh, a polarization in VZ is a uh, uh, bilinear form. Uh, let's call it QZ from VZ times VZ. To z, so bilinear, and uh, minus one to the n symmetric. So this is symmetric if n is even and uh, anti-symmetric if n is odd, such that. So you require uh, two properties on the associated emission form, and this is this emission form that will play a crucial role in what follows, such that if you define uh, age from uh, Vc times Vc to C, which is the associate emission form. So to Uv, you associate uh, Qc of uh, Uv bar. So Qc is the complexified bilinear form. And uh, this is not this emission form that you take, but you twist it by the veil operator associated to this uh, um, hot structure. Then uh, the requirement is that this emission form is positive definite. Yes, I will. I will write it uh, in one second, and uh, makes the Hodge decomposition uh, orthogonal, and makes uh, VC sum of VPQ uh, age orthogonal. Right, so. so here, as uh, of mentioned, here. Uh, C is a veil operator. Um, so this is multiplication by I uh, P minus Q and V P Q. Okay. And so this is this age that will play a, a crucial role for understanding uh, Ziegler sets. So uh, age is called the Hodge norm. Uh, associated to the polarization. Okay, so uh, so of course because you asked that uh, age is positive definite, this implies that Q is non-degenerate, and uh, well, uh, those conditions are called Hodge-Riemann uh, Bilinear uh, conditions. So they come from the geometric setting. So maybe I just give a quick uh, example for people who are not used to uh, this. So suppose that x is a uh, smooth projective of a C of dimension R, then the classical uh, Hodge package uh, uh, will be as follows. So first, uh, a polarization on Hn uh, x uh, z comes from uh, a polarization of x. And by this, I mean uh, that you fix uh, an ample uh, line bundle on X, or rather the ample class corresponding to this line bundle. Uh, so ample class omega in H2 of XZ. Right? And then uh, when you have this ample class, then you have the left shed operator, which is a wedge by this ample class. So you, goes, you go from uh, this cohomology to uh, the same common chip shifted by two. 
Then a basic uh, result in this uh, Hodge package is that uh, you have hard left shot theorem, so uh, it tells you that if you look at uh, the powers LR minus J uh, from AJ XQ, so you have to take rational coefficients to age uh, 2R minus J of XQ, uh, then this is an ISO. And then uh, this induces uh, uh, decomposition of your cohomology in terms of primitive cohomology. So you get that uh, age n of xq is a direct sum for i from 0 to uh, integral part of n over 2 of uh, li, and then the primitive cohomology in degree uh, n minus 2i of xq, uh, where this primitive cohomology is defined by taking the kernel uh, one uh, degree higher, so where uh, the uh, primitive cohomology in degree j, you can even define it over z, is the kernel of lr minus j uh, plus 1 from aj xz to uh, h2r minus j plus 1, uh, plus 2, sorry, of xz. So this is defined only up to the middle? Yes, sure. Okay. So in all this, you have to do up to the so Yeah, you have to say that some uh, some spaces are automatically zero. Not by the definition. Not by the definition, but I fix it, and I'm, I'm not writing it. You're right. Okay, and uh, so how do you get your polarization? Well, uh, the claim is that on each of these pages uh, there is a canonical polarization. Moreover, uh, QJZ. So the intersection of uh, product gives you a polarization on this primitive cohomology. So to alpha beta, you associate uh, the well, there is a sign, which is always a pain, j, j minus 1 over 2. And then there is this integral of x of this. Then the claim is that uh, this is a polarization of these hot structures. So uh, yeah, I should have mentioned this decomposition is in the category of uh, hot structures. So uh, this is a Z polarization of uh, the hot structure PJ XZ. And then, uh, well, you construct a polarization uh, on this by taking an appropriate uh, rational polarization of uh, taking a sum of those uh, QJZ on uh, those spaces, twisted by a sign, and then you multiply by an integ integer to get a, a, an integral polarization. Maybe I do not want to write everything here. Just take time. It's very classical, but uh, I just wanted to remind you uh, what happens. OK. Uh, and then, uh, of course, now uh, you extend this definition of polarization to families. So suppose now that you have a variation of a structure. So let uh, Vz uh, be nabla f. So with the notation as uh, yesterday. So this is your uh, local system of a z. This is the associated uh, holomorphic bundle, your flat connection, and the arch filtration. Uh, be uh, the variation of a structure on a smooth. quasi-projective uh, variety S of a C, uh, then a polarization for this uh, ZDHS is a <coughs> morphism of local system Vz to uh, Z um, on S analytic uh, such that at each point you have a polarization. It is a polarized uh, 
the art structure. So now I've recalled uh, all these uh, standard definitions in Hodge theory. So uh, I also want to make some remarks about the period domains and the period map that I defined yesterday. And uh, then we'll move to the proof of theorem one and two. So some remarks. By the way, no convection with the torsion or not? OK, so this is a difficult question. Uh, <laughs> of course, geometrically, you can get torsion. But uh, then, in some sense, you kill the torsion. It's not very important for what I'm saying. But uh, it varies uh, depending on the references. You can admit torsion or not. It's, not. it's not very important for what I'm doing. So yes, a priori, you can. Uh, some remarks on period domains and period maps. So uh, suppose you start with a polarizable Z variation of a structure. So this means that there exists a polarization. I do not necessarily fix it. At some point, I will fix it when I need it. Um, then uh, we know that for any S uh, in Sn, uh, the arch structure is given by uh, this morphism. So I'm moving to the letter phi because uh, h now will be this uh, Hodge norm. Yesterday I used the notation h, but uh, it was a mistake. So I correct it now. So we know that uh, you can interpret uh, the fact that uh, the fiber is a Hodge structure just by associating uh, this morphism from uh, this dulling torus. So uh, this guy is just C star seen as a real algebraic group. And then uh, you have this uh, morphism here that gives you this uh, Hodge decomposition. OK. And then, uh, as I explained yesterday, you can define the associated Mumforte group, GS. So this is a Mumforte group of phi s. So by uh, definition, this is phi s of uh, s. Then you take the Zarsky closure of a Q, and you know that this group detects all Hodge tensors uh, in this Hodge structure. So uh, this is a subgroup in uh, GL of uh, your fiber. And uh, what is easy to show, uh, as proven by Deline, is that uh, this, is, uh, uh, this association S gives uh, GS is a locally constant outside omega set. Uh, which is exactly the Hodge locus that I defined yesterday. Uh, it appears uh, at the beginning of the theory, you just know that this is a meager set in Sn. And then at the end of the story, you know that this is a countable union of uh, algebraic subvarieties. So uh, this means that uh, this uh, GS is generically uh, locally constant. So you define G as being the generic Mumforte group. of your variation. And uh, it's come equipped with, uh, so you fixed a hot generic point, and it gives you, at that point, you get uh, that morphism. OK. So uh, now, yesterday, I explained uh, um, what was I saying? Ah, yeah. So um, the period domain, one way, interesting way of defining your period domain directly using this generic Mumforte group is just that to say that uh, you define it as being the G of R uh, conjugacy class uh, of phi. And because I want to work, so in general, this is not necessarily connected, so I fix a connected component. And uh, you see that uh, it's naturally mapped to the G of C. Uh, conjugacy class of phi. And uh, this guy is exactly the, what I denoted d hat yesterday. OK, and uh, what you get also is that uh, now where is the polarizability useful? So the polarizability corresponds to the fact that if you look at 
the action, the adjoint action of phi of uh, i, then this is a Cartan involution on the adjoint group uh, r. Yeah. So this is where you use the polarizability. And then uh, it's easy to show that this d is really uh, g of r if you want g adjoint r uh, mod m. where m is a compact subgroup, and that, in fact, this natural map is an open immersion in a flag variety, which is your d hat, d chet, d, yeah, d check, uh, which is, in fact, d of c mod some parabolic subgroup. Okay, so the same construction as for Shimura variety uh, here. But it gives you, it gives you the same. Yeah, that you're right. You can take the, Hodge, the GFC conjugacy glass of uh, of uh, just uh, the character phi of z uh, one in uh, in GC, but it does not change anything. <coughs> then, uh, well, and your period map is just uh, as I explained yesterday. You take uh, the universal cover, and then you go to uh, d g mod m uh, by essentially associate so to a point uh, S tilde, you mapped it to uh, well, your uh, phi S tilde, which is conjugate to your initial uh, phi. And so it descends to uh, S an to uh, this variety S gamma gm, which is your quotient uh, by uh, uh, g of z. So gamma basically is an arithmetic subgroup. So you can see it here. Okay. So this I explained yesterday. What I want to say a bit uh, uh, about is the transversality condition because it, it will play an important role not today but next week. Ah, maybe there first. So what is this transversality condition? I remind you that if you have a variation of a structure, then you have this Griffiths condition that uh, the flat uh, connection uh, applied to uh, the filtration shifted by uh, one. So uh, how do you see that on the period map? Well, uh, you have this generic uh, Memforte group. And let's uh, look at it at the complexified level. And this induces uh, a Hodge filtration on the Lie algebra. Right? Because you just compose it with the adjoint action. Okay? So uh, this morphism, which is of course in fact defined over R give you hard structure on the associated uh, Lie algebra. So you get uh, this hard filtration there. And uh, so now if you want to interpret uh, uh, the tangent bundle to uh, D check, then you see that this is a GC equivalent uh, vector bundle with a fiber, which is uh, nothing else, of course, than uh, the Lie algebra GC modulo uh, the Lie algebra of the parabolic, which is in fact the F0 uh, GC uh, for this hot filtration. Okay. And uh, so now uh, the hot structure is of weight zero on GC, so it has a degree uh, everywhere. So let me rather write this as being F minus infinity. So this is the full uh, space if you want. And then uh, the, what is the horizontal tangent bundle? Well, you see that the filtration on, on GC induces a filtration on this guy, which uh, is equivalent under the action of GC. This is a GC module. So. And so uh, you get the filtration on the tangent uh, bundle, and uh, the horizontal one is just the first piece. So uh, the horizontal uh, tangent bundle. HD hat inside uh, T uh, D hat um, is 
the uh, holomorphic GC equivalent um, bundle associated to uh, uh, F minus one GC, F zero GC inside F minus infinity GC over F zero GC. Okay. And then the easy lemma to check is that the Griffith transversality condition, which is a condition that Nabla uh, F dot is contained in f dot minus one tensor omega one Sn is equivalent to the fact that when you look at the period map phi from uh, S to uh, S gamma Gm, uh, then this map is horizontal, meaning by this that uh, phi S uh, lower star of the tangent bundle to S uh, is mapped to uh, T H S gamma G M. Right. So, uh, just a word. Uh, I defined here the ta horizontal tangent bundle on this uh, uh, dual to uh, the period domain. Of course, it restricts to the period domain. Here, this is G C invariant. So, on the period domain, it becomes uh, G R invariant, and so it passes to the quotient. And so it defines an horizontal tangent bundle on those varieties. So F zero GC is the F zero GC is the is the Lie algebra of the corresponding parabolic, uh, which is the one that fixes the filtration. Exactly. So I I, I think I don't understand you wrote something like GC conjugacy classes of phi. Okay. But when so you write phi, phi complexify because C C star cos C star. And so it should be just phi of one. Let's write this, this one. This, this was the remark of Emmanuel. OK, so uh, you get this. And uh, why is this very important? Well, uh, for people familiar with uh, Shimura variety and Hermitian symmetric space, they know that from the complex point of view, those manifolds have negative curvature. OK? Uh, this is completely wrong. Uh, for uh, those uh, spaces um, S gamma GM. The reason being that they have uh, vertical fibers which are uh, kind of uh, flag varieties of smaller dimension. So they are positively curved. But uh, this result tells you that you are in a very special direction of that space and in that direction, basically, morally speaking, you have all the negative uh, curvature co properties that you have for usual Shimura varieties. And this will play a big role uh, next week. In fact, already today, but we won't see it in that form. OK, so uh, now uh, I want to uh, make a comment about uh, what I said yesterday about the algebraicity of those spaces, that they are almost never algebraic. So of course, they are complex analytic, because they are quotient uh, of complex analytic uh, stuff by uh, proper discontinuous action. But uh, so first, a lemma, which is to say that uh, the horizontal tangent, you can ask when is it true that the horizontal tangent bundle is the full tangent bundle. Okay? And essentially, this is true if only if uh, D is Hermitian symmetric domain. Uh, in which case, I will say that the variation is, a, is of Shimura type. So S gamma GM will be a Shimura variety. In particular, this will be algebraic. And uh, we say that, so this is for next week too, V is of Shimura type. And in some sense, this is really exceptional. This corresponds only to uh, uh, a billion motifs. OK. Um, the corollary of this, I will not write it, but I mention it, is that if you ask yourself uh, which hot structures, polarized hot structures, are geometric, right? If you are in weight one, uh, it happens that uh, this uh, Shimura variety 
will always parameterize uh, uh, geometric things because you can always associate uh, an abelian variety to your uh, polarized weight one heart structure. But uh, in higher weight, this condition of horizontality tells you that most uh, polarized heart structures are not geometric. Right. So, uh, and uh, so the next remark. Uh, is that uh, we can now answer uh, when is it true uh, that uh, S gamma GM is uh, algebraic? So when is S gamma GM algebraic? So uh, as I said, M is a compact subgroup, and in fact, it's contained in a unique maximal compact. So you can look at the projection of your D, which is G mod M, to the associated G mod K, which is uh, uh, symmetric, uh, symmetric space. Well, so M is contained in K, and K is maximal compact. In uh, G. So this is a vibration. Uh, just notice that in general, this, this guy has no complex structure. There is no reason why there should be. But the fibers are complex submanifold, so fibers are of the form uh, K mod M. So they are quotient of two compact groups. And it happens that they are holomorphic, uh, homogeneous varieties, so essentially flag varieties. OK. Then, uh, Uh, we'll say that uh, D is classical. This is a terminology of Griffiths that I don't like too much, but okay. Because in some sense they are classical, but they are also uh, the, uh, really the minority. So uh, D is classical if uh, the projection to uh, this uh, locally symmetric space to this symmetric space is uh, holomorphic or anti-holomorphic onto a Hermitian symmetric space. So basically, uh, D is classical. It's a bit of an enrichment in the case where uh, this map is an equality and D is already Hermitian symmetric. So you want some complex structure on G mod K? Yes, exactly. So this is what I'm saying. Uh, D is classical in the very rare case where this J mod K admits a complex structure. Not an, and so it is emission symmetric. And moreover, this projection is holomorphic or anti-holomorphic. If it is anti-holomorphic, you can change the complex structure. Exactly. So if you want, OK, I don't want to confuse you, so we can do this. That's correct. And, oh, and you don't assume anything about Iraq. Irreducibility, like if you have a product of many factors and many. No, uh, when I will say classical, this means that all the factors are classical in that sense. And it's equivalent to your definition yes. of one is to work in yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you have all this decomposition theorem for, emission, for, for symmetric spaces that you can decompose according to the factors of the group. And I'm really asking that this is true for all factors and this is equivalent to this. Okay. Uh, then uh, the theorem is that basically, if you are not in the Shimura case, or in some sense, in this enriched uh, Shimura case, um, then uh, then the quotient is never algebraic. So, so well, to, to do it uh, simple, simple, now let's assume for simplicity that uh, G is simple. So suppose. And D non classical. Yes, in the papers, I assume it is simple, but you can, ex but okay. Then S gamma GM is not algebraic. So this result tells you that in the vast majority of variation of our structures, uh, uh, then you are, not, you are not algebraic. So maybe I will try to give a rough idea uh, how it works, because I think this is of interest, even though I will not use it at all. But uh, it's interesting if you have never seen it. So
So, I mean, uh, this is an entire paper. I don't want to spend much time, but uh, I will give a rough idea. So, uh, so uh, what is the proof? So now, suppose uh, suppose we are in this setting. Suppose uh, d not classical, and uh, g a joint simple. Then what happens is that you look at those fibers, the fibers of P. Uh, homogeneous projective uh, varieties. And in this setting, you show that you can deform them. So when D, uh, D non classical, so this is a deformation argument, uh, implies that uh, one can deform uh, these fibers to obtain. Uh, compact, well, uh, homogeneous um, projective varieties, well, compact, let's say compact flag varieties in uh, D, not containing the fibers. And not only this, uh, you can deform, but uh, in fact, you really have a lot of them. In fact, uh, there are enough of them to uh, connect any two points by a chain. Connect any two points to connect any. Connect any two points of D by a chain of such flags. Right, so you have your uh, uh, D, D mod M, you pick any two points, then you will find uh, a chain, a finite chain of uh, such uh, flag varieties connected to two points. In particular, this implies that. S gamma GM is rationally connected because those flag varieties contain a lot of rational curves that are themselves rationally connected. So, okay. And so uh, now basically the idea, and this is where I'm not uh, technically precise at all, but the idea is that if S gamma GM were uh, algebraic, then this rationally connectedness would imply that the pi one is trivial. This is morally the idea. Okay, but the pi one is gamma, which is infinite. Contradiction. No, this is always the case because this G mod M, uh, this G mod M is always simply connected. Gamma is an arithmetic group yeah, yeah. in a non-compact real Lie group, so it's infinite. Okay. It's a lattice. Can you have a compact case, a special case where six are compact, or it's not possible? No, then the variation is trivial. It just means that the variation is trivial. There is no variation of a structure, right? If the what, what, do you, what do you mean compact? The compact quotient or uh, where G mod M compact? <laughs> if G mod M is compact, there is nothing. I mean. The Mumforte group, the generic Mumforte group, cannot have a real form which is compact. Otherwise, everything is trivial. Oh, there is no variation. Those from a variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always considering those things coming from the variation. Otherwise, I have to distinguish the case uh, compact and non-compact, of course. Okay. In the compact case, you are just in the case of usual uh, projective homogeneous varieties. And in the non-compact case, you are in those uh, partial uh, open flag varieties. And this is the reason. And also, that in the paper, they have something to get rid of the torsion. I mean, you yes. have to find a ramified coverage. Of course. I mean, all those groups are linear, so you have to get rid of, uh, you pass to finite index to get rid of the torsion and so on. 
but here I'm going fast. <laughs> okay. So okay, so this is a rough idea. Of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, inaccuracies in what I said, and you have to be careful about the technical details. But uh, I think this is really the idea of the proof. Okay, so uh, this is, these are the remarks that I wanted to make. So the situation is really that if you think in terms of variation of structures, then you are really in a non-algebraic situation uh, generically. Okay, so uh, let's go to uh, what I uh, mentioned uh, yesterday. So uh, three uh, definability of arithmetic quotients of S gamma G M. Okay. So I remind you the theorem one that I mentioned yesterday. So due to Baker, uh, Timmerman, um, and myself. So. So uh, there were two parts. First is that uh, this uh, S gamma GM has a natural structure of R alg manifold. Okay, so this means that you can, I remind you, this means that you can find a finite atlas uh, of charts for this guy such that the charts are semi-algebraic and the change of coordinates are semi-algebraic. And the naturality will be explained uh, in the proof. And second, and uh, well, it's part of the naturality, but is that in, this is functorial for morphism of uh, such arithmetic quotients. So any morphism uh, S gamma G, S gamma prime, G prime, M prime to S gamma G, M of arithmetic quotients is R alg definable. Okay, so basically what is uh, a morphism of arithmetic quotient? I explained yesterday. This means that it comes from a morphism of algebraic groups from G prime to G, mapping gamma prime to gamma, and mapping M prime to a conjugate of M by a rational element. Okay. And then this induces such a map. Uh, okay, so let's try now to uh, give the idea of the proof of this. So I will deal uh, essentially with one first. So we deal with one. So the first remark, so those questions S gamma G M is uh, gamma back um, uh, G mod M. So G is G of R, so this is a semi-algebraic set. And then this is a classical result that if you take the quotient by a compact group of something semi-algebraic, then it still has a semi-algebraic uh, structure. So as M is compact, the semi-algebraic structure on uh, G, which is G of R, uh, gives rise to a unique uh, semi-algebraic structure on G mod M, uh, making the natural projection G to G mod M uh, semi-algebraic. So uh, I say this is classical. It has been long known uh, for a long time by uh, people working in uh, group theory. Uh, there is a purely algebraic proof. There is also a proof uh, from model, I mean, from ominimality uh, point of view, uh, in terms of uh, definable quotients for a proper uh, for a proper uh, closed relation. So I will not uh, insist on this. What is interesting is, of course, the other quotient, because gamma now is infinite, so it's not a stupid thing. Uh, taking a quotient by an infinite group is forbidden uh, uh, for minimal uh, reasons. So uh, this is uh, the uh, part which is not completely trivial. So what is the idea? Uh, the idea is that uh, if x is a, a definable 
uh, a space. So here, uh, definable mean definable in some O minimal structure. Uh, then uh, the definable uh, geometric quotient uh, x mod r um, exists um, if r in uh, x times x is a closed definable etal equivalent solution. <coughs> so what do I uh, mean by this uh, quotient? This means that uh, this quotient be, will be uh, y such that x to y is uh, definable. Uh, the fibers are exactly the R equivalence class and uh, Y as a quotient topology. Yes. No, 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 you want closed. You really want closed. <laughs> Why as a quotient topology? And here, the important remark is that because you are assuming that this is definable, uh, uh, etal means finite etal. Right? Because you have r in x times x, the first projections map this definable guy to this definable guy, and it has to be a definable map. So the fibers have to be finite. So etal is really finite etal. Why, why hmm? why is it, it is automatic because the fibers are a discrete set right. which is definable. So, but, why the cardinality cannot change? but this is what I explained yesterday is that, ah, okay, I was not, uh, I should have mentioned this, is that in a definable setting, uh, the cardinality is uh, uniformly bounded. But not, but not constant. It's constant on connected stuff. So why you cannot have special points where the, so you have an entire equivalence relation. Yes. Uh, and uh, like in algebraic geometry, you can have an entire equivalence relation. Yes. And uh, the, the entire morphism is, of course, uh, finite when you Finite etal after stratify. Yes. But at some point, the number. Okay, I, when I say finite, okay. You mean finite etal after stratification? This is what you mean? Yes, yes that's correct. Oh, I completely agree. I was not saying that. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, this is an easy uh, exercise. In fact, uh, yeah. Uh, so, of course, we cannot apply this result here because gamma is infinite. So, as gamma is infinite, we cannot apply to uh, the equivalence relation R gamma inside uh, uh, G mod M cross G mod M, right? Where uh, this equivalence relation uh, given by x, r, y, if there exists gamma and gamma, such that x is gamma y. OK? Uh, but the idea is to replace uh, g mod m uh, by a sufficiently nice uh, fundamental set, and then I can do this. So we look for a fundamental set, a semi-algebraic uh, fundamental set, uh, f for gamma, and then uh, we apply to uh, f times f, and then 
you apply this equivalence relation, that will be et al. OK. Uh, so uh, the idea is to construct such a canonical fundamental set. And uh, well, such things have been existing uh, forever, namely since the 60s. Uh, this is a theory of Ziegel sets. So let me explain this, because this is a crucial point uh, in, in the paper. So uh, F uh, will be a finite union of uh, Ziegel sets uh, like this. So of course, uh, um, if, if S gamma GM is itself compact, then there is nothing to do. You just take any uh, semi-algebraic fundamental set, and it works. But the problem are the cusps. So uh, let me try to recall uh, briefly uh, the definition of those Ziegel sets. And uh, we really need it. So I'm sorry to impose you this, but uh, this is really needed to prove that the, uh, this is the way you prove that the map itself is definable. You will use those Ziegel sets. So it's a bit heavy, but uh, there is no choice. So, uh, so what is the intuition? The intuition is that the cusp are essentially uh, parameterized by conjugacy gamma conjugacy classes of parabolics. So I recall a few facts. So the cusps of S gamma GM are uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with the gamma conjugacy classes of uh, Q parabolics. P of uh, G. And the uh, basic result of, of Borel is that this is a finite set. So this is, this is a finite set. And I fix representatives that I will call P1, PS. Yeah, proper. as yesterday. Hmm? OK, it's a way of going to infinity. I'm not very precise here. But uh, I'm just saying that canonically to that space, uh, uh, you. Uh, but the Shimon Racket, it wouldn't be the Liberal. It could be Maximum Spectacle or something like that. Yeah, it will be Borel, sir. I will explain. Um, um, OK, so now uh, I fix one of those parabolics. So let P uh, be uh, a parabolic subgroup And then basically, uh, you will associate to a pair of a parabolic and a maximal compact subgroup can associate a Ziegel set in the group G. And then a Ziegel set in G mod M will just be the projection in G mod M of a Ziegel set in G. So how does it work? Well, the first thing you do is that you write the uh, canonical decomposition, uh, Levy decomposition, uh, in a two, uh, some, um, reductive part and uh, a unipotent part. So this is a Levy decomposition. So recall that this guy is a unipotent radical of P, so it's canonical. This guy is a quotient of P by NP. Uh, so this semi-direct product is not canonical. It's only canonical as a quotient. But now I will use a compact subgroup so that at the level of R points, I get a canonical lift. So this is what I want to do in the next step. But uh, first, I continue writing a bit of this. So uh, you write, OK, so you can write it as being AP uh, MP times uh, NP, where now uh, uh, AP is a a connected component of uh, split uh, center of LP. Okay. So now uh, you get associated to this and uh, uh, the choice uh, of a maximal compact. So now if you have P and uh, K a maximal compact, 
then uh, you get really the composition of G, the set of real points, as being uh, APK times uh, MPK times NP times K. Uh, so this is uh, your uh, parabolic decomposition of G. Uh, so uh, I just have to explain uh, uh, what it is. So this guy is a unique uh, real Levy of PR um, stable lifting um, LP and stable and there's a Cartan involution uh, defined by K. So it's a bit technical, but uh, okay. So now, uh, what is the Ziegel set uh, associated with those data? So the first remark is that this APK, it is really the same thing as uh, R larger than zero to the power uh, a certain number, which is uh, the cardinal ID of the set of simple roots of AP acting on NP. So simple roots of the root system of root system phi. A, P, and P. Okay, so it's a it's a nice uh, 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 linear space, and uh, the notation will be that to A, I associate uh, A to the power minus alpha one, A to the power minus alpha uh, R, where R is this cardinality. So these are the simple roots. Okay, so uh, with those notations, what is the Ziegel set? So you want to describe a very particular set using this decomposition. So a Ziegel set of G uh, associated with PK uh, is a guy sigma of the form U cross uh, APKT. So basically, you want to look only how to go to, you go to infinity uh, in the direction of this torus. So times W inside this decomposition NP APK, and then uh, W will be in MPKK. Okay, and what are the properties? U and W are relatively compact. And semi-algebraic, open semi-algebraic. This makes sense in this independent group and in that group. And uh, uh, A, P, K, T, and And uh, AP K uh, T. So T is a real number, and you are just taking all the, ga the guys in uh, AP K such that A to the power alpha is larger than T. Okay, so if you are in SL2, uh, well, I will go to the quotient. Uh, so this was for G, and now for G mod M. So a Ziegel set is the image, and uh, uh, G goes to uh, G mod M of a Ziegel set of uh, G associated with some parabolic P and some k containing m. 
so that you don't uh, here the action on the right is nice. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is the definition, and of course you have the standard picture that you know for SL two. Example, if you take uh, so SL2 or SO2, so this is the usual upper half plane H, so uh, you are in this situation. So uh, now, uh, what is the Ziegel set? Well, basically, the Ziegel set will be given by, uh, for instance, you fix the real part between 0 and 1, and then you ask that uh, Y is larger than some T. And with the right choice of normalization, this t is really the t appearing here. Right? So there is only one root because you are in rank 1. And you are asking that you go to infinity. So this will be of this type. Okay. Uh, hmm. So, uh, OK. Uh, so what are, what are the theorems then that we use? The first one is a result of Borel. So it says that there exist finitely many Ziegel sets sigma i uh, associated with pi. So pi uh, is this uh, finite collection here of gamma conjugacy glasses and some ki uh, whose image uh, covers as gamma gm. Right? And so you take the union of those finitely many, and this gives you a, a fundamental set that you want to consider. And then you take the etal uh, quotient relation of those. And uh, the uh, second point of uh, Borel theorem is that uh, uh, this is fine. You can do that, because for any uh, sigma 1, uh, sigma 2 uh, Ziegel sets, uh, then the uh, intersection, the number of gamma uh, pushing one to the other is finite. Uh, different from is finite. No, you can also, you, you can make them bigger enough to cover everything. Sorry? Yes, I, I said that I was not in the case where S gamma GM is compact because then everything is trivial. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is the first result. So this means that you can do the procedure that I said because of this property, the equivalence relation now which is defined is, uh, is a finite etal in the sense that I mentioned. And so you can take this quotient and this gives you the structure. Now, what about uh, the nat naturality? Uh, well, uh, this is given by uh, OR, so uh, 2. So this is, in fact, what is strange is that this is a, a recent result, uh, which was not written at the time where uh, this theory was developed, is that uh, the image of any Ziegel set uh, uh, so let f from g prime to g uh, morphism of uh, group, which kind of a Q, uh, the image of any Ziegel set uh, uh, of G prime by a morphism uh, by, uh, by, this, by, by F is contained. So of course, this is not necessarily a Ziegel set, but this is contained in finitely many Ziegel sets. In finitely many. Sets uh, ah, in finitely uh, translate finitely many translates 
by element of g of q And uh, okay, and so basically uh, the theorem which is here uh, uh, follows uh, from uh, one and two here uh, in respective order. So I'm not giving uh, the full details, but I think at least this is uh, believable. Uh, I would just like to make a remark. Uh, I was precise in this way because I wanted to say to have a nice statement in terms of uh, definability of a R algebra. In fact, for uh, what follows, you don't really need it. It's enough to have definability over Rn, for instance. And there, you could just appeal to uh, the classical barrel uh, theory. In fact, those Ziegel sets are the basic tool to construct the barrel cell compactification. Now, barrel cell compactification is a real, manifold, real analytic manifold with corners. And so the only thing that I'm saying is that uh, uh, the real analytic structure on S gamma GM expanding its R L structure is just the one given on uh, the complement of the boundary of a real analytic manifold with corner. Okay, so as you see, basically this result is uh, is uh, essentially uh, completely classical. What is not completely trivial is this, but this is uh, Martin's uh, Martin Hall's uh, result. Okay. All right. So uh, now a very important thing for me that I want to keep is that you see those Ziegel sets are in some sense nice from a group theoretic point of view, but it's kind of complicated to make computations with them. So the only thing that I want to really understand is uh, Ziegel set for uh, SLNR. So, uh, or GLNR. So uh, this will be uh, the following example. Let x be uh, GL VR. So V is the phi, is my fiber of my uh, variation of our structure. And uh, I can consider uh, this uh, symmetric space. So this is a symmetric space of positive of positive definite uh, quadratic forms on VR, then uh, I fix a basis uh, E uh, be a basis of VZ and uh, C be larger than zero, a constant. And then the definition is the following. Suppose that you have a point in uh, this symmetric space. So this is a quadratic form. Uh, then I will say that it is uh, reduced with respect to uh, the basis E and uh, the constant C. So this is EC reduced uh, if the following inequalities are satisfied. So this is classical reduction theory. Uh, you ask that when you evaluate your quadratic form uh, on EI, EI, then in absolute value, this is smaller than, uh, ah, sorry, EJ, C, uh, B of EI, EI, for all IJ, uh, B, B is that uh, B of EI EI uh, is smaller than C of uh, B uh, of EJ EJ for all I strictly smaller than J. And C that uh, the product for I is equal to 1 to R of B of EI EI is smaller than C determinant B. So the idea is that you are only really fixing, uh, in terms of a basis and a constant, a lot of uh, numerical conditions on a certain set of uh, quadratic forms. Okay, and then, so this is the end of the definition. Then, uh, what is the claim that will be uh, really useful? 
is that uh, so let's uh, uh, GEC be uh, the subset of X of uh, B satisfying uh, those properties. Okay. Then uh, the first claim is that this set is contained in a single set. Uh, of X and any single set of X is contained in some is contained in some uh, JEC. Okay, so I don't really understand single sets in other terms and uh, in terms of uh, group theory. But what I know is that uh, purely in terms of quadratic forms, uh, those numerical conditions give me an approximation of them. And B, which will be very important, is that if uh, there is a B in X, which uh, is E prime, C prime reduced uh, for some E prime and some C prime, and E is another basis, E is a basis for which condition C is satisfied, uh, for some C. Sorry? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, you can just take classical ones or minimal ones. And E is a basis which satisfies condition C uh, for some constant. Uh, then there exists another constant, C double prime, depending only on E, only on E, C, E prime, C prime, such that B is also E, C double prime reduced. So uh, this part B is very important. It tells you that if you know that you are E, C, e prime, C prime reduced, then uh, in fact, uh, uh, you can find a basis. Uh, um, uh, if you have a basis which satisfies already the uh, third condition, then up to changing the constant, uh, you can assume that you are E reduced uh, uh, for that basis. So it will play an important role. Uh, uh, at the end of the lecture. Okay, so I want to keep this. So if you, if I start erasing this, uh, just shout. Okay, so uh, this is what I wanted to say about the definability of uh, the quotient. So uh, I want to uh, go to the definability of uh, the period map. which is the main part of this lecture. So uh, so uh, this is the main result in that paper. So as I explained yesterday, it reproves uh, catenidine kaplan uh, theorem. Uh, so suppose you start with the variation uh, which is polarizable, uh, VHS, uh, ZVHS, uh, and S is smooth quasi projective as usual. Let's see. So I remind you the statement. It tells you that if you look at the associated period map, so it goes, this is a holomorphic horizontal map uh, going to this uh, classifying space, then uh, this is R and X. Uh, definable. Uh, so let's be precise. Uh, so I explained yesterday that if you have a complex uh, projective uh, varieties and it is canonically uh, definable over R n or even R alge, uh, this one we just proved that this is definable over R alge. 
So the air annex definability is with respect to the air annex expansion of those two real algebraic uh, structure here and here, okay? So this I said yesterday. So what is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is that uh, we have a finite atlas of charts here given by those Ziegel sets. I will be able to find a finite atlas of charts here so that when I write this map uh, with respect to those two atlas of charts, then I use only the real exponential map and real analytic functions restricted to compact. This is the meaning of this. Okay. Uh, so maybe I will make a few comments that I will not write. Uh, the first one is that uh, this statement is easy in the case which never happens in nature where this guy is compact. This quotient can be compact. It never happens, but okay. So, uh, so why I is it easy? Then in the case where this guy is compact, I claim that you don't need the uh, real exponential function. It's even definable in R n. So what is the argument? The argument is you start with your uh, smooth quasi-projective thing. Then you embed it in S bar with a strict normal crossing divisor as complement, okay? Now, Borel, uh, Borel theorem tells you that the monodromy at infinity around this uh, strict normal crossing divisor is quasi unipotent. Okay? But if this guy is compact, this means exactly that gamma does not contain any unipotent element. So this tells you that the monodromy is trivial. But then the period map will extend to S bar. Okay? And then you will just get a usual complex analytic map from S bar to that compact thing, and so this is definable in Rn. So the moral of this is that Borel, uh, Borel theorem about uh, the monoromy being unipotent is already a tameness assumption. Okay? And it's well known if you do homogeneous dynamics, then uh, unipotent or unipotent stuff is much better uh, than uh, um, toric uh, elements. So this was the first remark. Uh, the second remark is that suppose you assume that you are in the case of a Shimura variety. So this guy is algebraic, okay? And this guy is algebraic. And now I've constructed a holomorphic map, which is definable in some ominous structure between two algebraic stuff. Then I can apply the theorem of Petersen and Starchenko that I mentioned yesterday, and this tells you that this map is automatically algebraic, okay? Which is a well-known theorem of Borel. So Borel proved that if you have a variation of a structure with target to Shimura variety, or more generally, if you have any holomorphic map, uh, from a, uh, an algebraic variety to a Shimura variety, then it, it, it is automatically algebraic. So but you have an case here. Okay, uh, torsion freeness is not a big deal in that business because uh, you can always go to finite index subgroup by taking a ramify, uh, an etal cover of your manifold and you deduce the algebraicity and then you deduce also the algebraicity of the question. C to C. Hmm? You, can get, you can get maps from C to C that are not algebraic. No, but uh, okay, I'm assuming here that I'm working with, uh, okay. <laughs> You're perfectly right. So uh, I'm just saying that at the level, if I kill the torsion, then this is fine. Okay. It's not kind of clear, right? No, no, you're right. It's not kind of clear, you have to start for a polarized vari variation of all structure, or is there a way to formulate the condition that Griffiths was from as a from half west up to some six of the type S gamma GM, it's like slightly more generally than things coming from duration of all such, or is it just, well, I'm not an expert in this, but is it? No, but uh, the description that I give, so if you have a, a polarizable variation of a structure, you can associate to it a period map. But if you have a period map, in the sense you have a holomorphic map, which is horizontal and locally liftable, so to take care of this problem of torsion that is just mentioned, then it corresponds to a variation of our structure. Yeah, because the gamma GM comes from the, okay, so the question is the choice of the gamma GM. Yes. Are just those, you don't have more general choices for which those theorems apply, just. Well, I think this is pretty general. I mean, um, if you give me an interesting class of, so is it, what is crucial is that M is compact. Uh, for this business to construct uh, the definable structure on the quotient. 
So if M is not compact, I don't know anything. If you give me another class of compact subgroups such that uh, those, and another class of gamma such that those guys are complex analytic, then maybe I can do something. But uh, I'm just saying that I don't know any other interesting class basically entering in, into uh, this. OK? So. No, because there was a question before about the compact case, which doesn't arise from both structures. Yes. So. OK, so uh, let's go to the proof of this. Uh, OK, so let me first try to uh, describe uh, the strategy of the proof and uh, then go to the technical detail. So uh, let me call n the dimension of uh, S. And so uh, I choose, as I said, I choose a strictly normal crossing uh, compactification. So strictly normal crossing divisor that I can always do. And uh, so uh, what is the picture at infinity? The picture of, at infinity is that I have something like delta to the n. So this is smooth. And uh, luckily, at a point on here, I have a delta to the n. And uh, the embedding is, uh, because I have a strict normal crossing divisor, is delta star to the r times uh, delta n minus r. Right? So this is the local picture at infinity in uh, analytic coordinates. So the first thing that we do is that we cover S bar by finitely many, finitely open subsets of this shape. And if you want, you can add big compact sets that will play no role in the definability. And uh, so uh, you see that what we are really reduced to is uh, we are reduced Uh, to prove that uh, the local period map, so I restrict my phi to each of those. So I get basically uh, a period map on there. And then assuming that there might be some trivial monodromy, I can always suppose that r is equal to n. So I have a period map, like a local period map, like what I call a local period map like this. And we want to prove that this is uh, R and X uh, definable. R, R and X uh, definable. So this is really a local question. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, again, I use Borel uh, theorem. Uh, for those who are not familiar, I should mention that Boyle theorem, one way of proving Boyle theorem is exactly using the negative uh, curvature property in the horizontal direction. So what I said uh, before was really relevant here. So uh, Borel tells you that uh, the monodromy of uh, Vz uh, on uh, delta star to the n uh, is uh, quasi unipotent. Right? So uh, by passing to a finite et al cover, which is not a problem for this definability uh, question, uh, without loss of generality, we can assume it is unipotent And so uh, we are in the following situation. Now, uh, I uh, draw the same diagram for my period map as usual, but everything is local now. So the universal cover of uh, uh, this product of punctured disk is just uh, upper half pay uh, to the n. And then I have this holomorphic uh, horizontal map phi twilder to d, which is g mod m. Okay. And here, this is the usual uniformization. So the crucial fact is that in restriction to a uh, Ziegel set here, uh, this uh, uniformization will be Rnx definable because this map is just an exponential. So this is exponential. 2 pi i dot 
uh, to the n. So uh, now I, I gave you the picture for a Ziegel set in uh, H. So a Ziegel set in H to the n is just a product. So uh, let sigma H, as usual, be uh, the standard Ziegel set where uh, well, Z is x plus i y. So now I choose coordinates where x is between 0 and 1, and y is strictly larger than 1. And then, uh, uh, so the point is that uh, delta star to the n is covered by, uh, finite by p of sigma h uh, to the n and p of a translate of sigma h to the n. And so uh, for proving the definability, it is enough to restrict myself to uh, p of such a guy. And so uh, you notice that exponential 2 pi i dot as a function on sigma h uh, to delta star is uh, definable, because this is x plus i y is mapped to exponential minus uh, 2 pi y. And then you have cosinus uh, 2 pi x sine 2 pi x. But now uh, x is bounded. This is a crucial point. This is because of the choice of this Ziegel set, I'm killing the periodicity. So this is in Rn, right? This is a restriction of a real analytic function to a compact set, uh, x between 0 and 1. And when I read in English, i is y, so that's bad. And, so, and here, this is just a usual real exponential function. So I get, I get that this is definable in r exp in R and X. Okay. So, uh, if I look at my diagram, now I'm in business because uh, we are reduced uh, to proving Right, so I have my Ziegel set in H to the N. I have uh, my period map phi tilde to uh, D G mod M. Then I have my projection pi to S gamma G M. And I wanted to prove that uh, this map here uh, uh, to delta star P of uh, sigma H to the end, I wanted to prove that this map is definable. So this is enough to prove that this map is definable because I just proved that this one is. So it is enough. So you can forget about this. It's enough to prove that this projection composed with phi tilde is definable. So, what does it mean? Well, uh, this follows from, uh, this is implied by the following uh, theorem A, maybe I will write it like this. So you are in this local situation. Uh, let uh, phi uh, delta star to the n to s gamma gm, your local period map. Then uh, the claim is that uh, there exists. Recall that the uh, RL structure here comes from Ziegel set there. So uh, there exists finitely many uh, Ziegel sets uh, sigma i in G mod m, such that uh, first, and this is a crucial point. The image of phi uh, on uh, sigma h to the n is contained in a f the, the union of those finitely many single sets. 
and uh, B, uh, if you look at phi tilde restricted to this uh, Ziegel set in the product, uh, uh, then this is uh, R and X definable. Right? So I'm just saying that to prove that this map is R and X definable, it's enough to prove that this one is, but also that it arrives in finitely many charts for this one. Okay. And now you see that this is a statement in asymptotic uh, Hodge theory. You want to understand how your variation of a structure uh, degenerate when you go to infinity. Uh, and this is an extremely uh, developed theory quite technical, sadly. So it was, <laughs> it was <laughs> you can ask Javier, I'm sure he had a lot of pleasure preparing the talk for Bobaki on this. <laughs> uh, so it was developed in the 70s, uh, first in the case when n is equal to one, and this was done by Schmidt, and this is a very nice paper. What is surprising is that passing to a larger n is extremely difficult. So it took uh, Schmidt and other people uh, more than uh, 10 years to uh, do this. So, and uh, Catani, uh, Kaplan, and Schmidt finally uh, got really a full theory uh, for uh, n larger strictly than one. So, the first remark is that out of Schmidt paper, this is explicitly written in the paper, you get already this statement for n is equal to one. In other words, if you have a variation of a, a single punctured disk, then uh, you have this surprising uh, nice topological statement, and when you take a fundamental set here uh, in H, then it is mapped, you can find a single Ziegel set to which you are mapped. Why in the definition of the fundamental set you put x between 0 and 1 and not let us say between 0 and 2 and then it will cover everything? Is it a problem in the proof that you don't have to make a chance? Uh, it's just that later, no, you could do that first, but uh, here it's just uh, that uh, everything is much easier if you really restrict to uh, 0 and 1 uh, later in the proof. It's not. So, uh, anyway, the structure of the Ziegel set on the source is not very important. You can choose any Ziegel set you want. I, I chose this one because it's convenient, but the statement is true for any. And also the module is covered by this and the translate, maybe it's not accurate, maybe you need two to the end translates because you have... Yes, okay. And finitely, what is important is the finiteness, finitely many translates. You're right. I was thinking in the n is equal to one uh, case. Ah, I'm not allowed to erase this, so uh, let's go back there. So uh, what I'm saying is that n is equal to 1 follows from Schmidt. Uh, and this also follows from Schmidt. Uh, what is difficult is this statement for n larger than 1. So B is classical, is implied by Schmidt uh, nilpotent orbit theorem. So how much time do I have? Ah, okay. Um, so uh, we know that we have this monodromy T1 and Tn. So the fundamental group of uh, uh, this delta star to the n is z to the n. So I choose image of the monodromy. So let t1, tn in g of z be uh, the unipotent uh, monodromies. Right? I'm, I've reduced myself to the case where the monodromy is unipotent, not quasi-unipotent. And then uh, this means that I can write each ti as being exponential of ni, where ni is a nilpotent element Uh, in uh, G, the Lie algebra, and uh, because the uh, fundamental group is commutative, the Ni and J uh, commute. Okay. Then uh, uh, Schmidt uh, remarks. So, what is the uh, 
what is uh, uh, nilpotent orbit theorem, uh, Schmidt uh, noticed that, and in fact it was noticed before by uh, Griffiths, but uh, the, the theorem was already proved by Schmidt, is that uh, you can uh, twist uh, the period map. So consider the following twist, psi from h n. So now you will not go to d, but to uh, the dual flag variety, which consists in twisting uh, or detwisting, if you want, uh, your uh, phi. Okay. Then now uh, this function uh, is monotony invariant, right? If you are adding one to each of those variables, then you perturb by exponential minus zj, which is um, uh, uh, tj minus one, and here you have a tj getting out. So this becomes monotony invariant. So this means that it descends uh, to uh, a map psi from delta star to the n uh, to uh, d check. So understanding the asymptotic of uh, phi is the same thing as understanding the asymptotic of this simpler function uh, here. And then uh, what is the Schmidt theorem? Schmidt theorem tells you that uh, this function extends. So uh, Schmidt uh, theorem psi extends uh, holomorphically uh, to uh, delta n. So uh, the value f infinity, which is by definition psi of zero, so this is an element in D check and insist usually this is not in D, is called the uh, limiting uh, hot filtration. And it tells you that out of this uh, limiting object, you can construct a new, more or less trivial period map, which is a nilpotent orbit that approximates the original one. Moreover, exponential sum of the zj uh, uh, nj applied to this f infinity lies in d for uh, 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 z large. And is asymptotic is asymptotic to a psi. So the picture is the following. You have d inside uh, d hat. So this is an open analytic. Uh, you construct, uh, by this twisting, you construct some element f infinity. Then you have a very homogeneous map. This is just given, so this is called a nilpotent orbit. This is this nilpotent orbit. And uh, it's going there, and uh, you know that you, have, you had your original uh, period map, and you know that those things become very fast asymptotic. So I will not write the asymptotic here, but this is what happened. So this is phi of z, and this is exponential. So here, let's say you have a point here, and very close, you have a point of the form zg and g, uh, f infinity. So they converge very fast. So in some sense, this is a simple algebraic model of uh, what the period map is. Okay. So in geometric terms, this corresponds to the statement that I gave yesterday, uh, that uh, the hot filtration on uh, your uh, vector bundle V extends to uh, the link canonical uh, extension as a, a sub-bundle. Okay, so this tells you that uh, phi tilde of Z1, Zn now becomes something of the form exponential sum of the Zj and J times psi of uh, the projection of Z1ZN in the polydisc. So now uh, psi is holomorphic, uh, uh, so and in, uh, in Rn, because now this works really, I'm really working on the uh, polydisc, so this is compact. Uh, and I know that this map is definable, Rn x uh, definable on sigma Hn. And this one looks bad because this is an exponential, a complex exponential. But uh, the nj are nilpotent, so this is a polynomial. So 
So uh, this tells you that uh, this map uh, is definable, and so this is your statement uh, B here. OK. Uh, so now we are restricted to prove uh, A. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, A for n is equal to 1 was proven by Schmidt using a refinement, but the very deep one of uh, the nilpotent orbit theorem, saying that once you have the nilpotent orbit, you can ever uh, approximate it better by an SL2 orbit. So you can totally embed, totally geodesically embed some age. That will also approximate, so in this picture, there will be a third orbit, uh, even more regular, because it will come from an SL2, and coming from a, an algebraic morphism from SL2 to G. OK? But the point is that, uh, and this is a statement that took uh, 10 years to be proven in uh, multivariables case. So, uh, all right. So we don't want to do this. You don't, we don't want to use uh, uh, the uh, full power of uh, uh, the SL2 to the n orbit theorem in many variables. Uh, so we will use only, so the, the key word is that we use only part of what is in that paper, and which was in fact proven before by Kashiwa, namely some norm et estimates. So we use only norm estimates, which are implied by uh, the usual SL2 orbit uh, uh, theorem in one variable. So let me, let me make a philosophical comment here. I mean, uh, really, ah, I just erased A, that's too bad. So you want to prove that this uh, phi uh, of delta of um, sigma h to the n lies in finitely many Ziegel sets. Basically, what Schmidt tells you is that if you start with any delta star embedded in your delta star to the n, then the image will, uh, for, for the corresponding Ziegel set will lie in finitely many. And the idea is that, of course, you can cover this uh, sigma star to the n by a lot of sigma star. And you know that in restriction to each of them, you are mapped to finitely many. So in some sense, what you are looking at is really a uniformity uh, statement. Right? Because it's not clear that all of them will lie in a, finitely, a finite collection, uh, in the same finite collection. OK, so, uh, and so this is where we die. Hmm. Uh, I don't think I will have time to prove uh, everything today. May, uh, I don't want to rush too much, so maybe I will give more de some details and uh, try to finish, uh, finish this next time. So uh, this is really a um, degeneration of uh, hot structures. So there is some mixed theory. So I uh, recall uh, a mixed hot structures on Vz is a, a, a filter, an increasing filtration on uh, Vq which is called the weight filtration, and such that uh, the Gre uh, pieces for uh, this uh, weight filtration is a rational pure hot structure of weight L. Okay, so this is a standard definition. So uh, an important fact due to the lean, so you see that uh, mixed structures are bifiltered objects. But the remark of the lean is that bifiltration are bad, but bigraduation are good. And uh, uh, the remark is uh, that the lean says this is equivalent to a bigraduation. So it looks like pure Hodge theory, uh, su uh, such that uh, WL is the sum for uh, R plus L, R, R plus S uh, smaller than L of uh, I uh, R S. Uh, maybe I will continue there. So this is the first condition. The Hodge filtration in terms of this by graduation. Yeah, I'm coming. Yes, uh, you mean, uh, ah, here? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, but this is, OK. So you have the filtration F on uh, VC, such that the induced filtration on those GRE uh, defines a rational uh, QH structure. On the OK. 
Thanks. Uh, uh, Fp uh, is a sum for r larger than p uh, of irs. And uh, the condition now that means that this is not pure but mixed is that if you take the conjugate of that space, then this is essentially uh, the same I ISR, except that now this is a mod uh, plus IAB for A uh, smaller than R and uh, B smaller than S. I hope I'm not making mistake about the indices here, but I think this is okay. Okay. So when you don't have these conditions, this is pure, but otherwise uh, this is mixed. Uh, and so now when so let me write this. Uh, when you have really uh, the equality, then uh, this is an equality uh, now uh, uh, over R. So uh, we say that VZF is uh, R split. It's said to be R split. So this is an important fact that when you study mixture structures, uh, usually you try first to reduce to the R split ones. Uh, yeah, this is uniquely. So, and in some sense, this is a way you prove that uh, this is uh, an abelian category. Um, uh, so, uh, a remark of Dolin is that if you start with any uh, mixture structure, then you can associate to it. Uh, uh, canonically, uh, uh, a split one, a real split one. So, of course, uh, mixed structure is not a direct sum of pure, but if you extend the scalars to R, then essentially uh, it becomes, in an, I mean, you can deform it to a one, which is where, uh, so you twist your hot filtration by some uh, automorphism, which is complex only, uh, where Delta, in fact, you choose it in the sum of A, B, uh, negative. Okay, so now uh, this is a, a painful part where you have to make uh, the degeneration, or maybe I want to go yeah, I have no choice, right? Hmm. You know what? Uh, I will not make the degeneration now. I will try. Um, I will try to give uh, the heart of the argument because if I go to the degeneration anyway, everybody will have forgotten next week, and I will have to start again. So. Uh, so forget about uh, mixed structures and let's go uh, directly. Uh, uh, even I, so <laughs> I don't want to do it two times. So uh, okay, so um, so let me recall you what we want to prove. We want to prove that if I start, if I start from that guy, then I can map it to finitely many Ziegel sets in G mod M. So the first thing that I do is that I embed. Uh, I use the fact that I have a canonical representation in G. GLVQ, and this induces uh, an embedding of D inside the associated uh, Riemannian symmetric space. And this map, if you think about it, is just to a point Z, you associate the Hodge norm at that point. Okay? Uh, so the Hodge norm, where well, AZ is the Hodge norm corresponding to the Hodge structure to the hot structure uh, Z. Okay, so now uh, what is the argument? The argument is that you want to prove that, to show that uh, your sigma H to the N is mapped to finitely many Ziegel set there, I claim this is enough to prove the same statement in X. And this comes from the second part of the theorem that tells you that the pre image of any Ziegel set is contained in finitely many Ziegel sets here. So as uh, yota minus one of Ziegel set is contained in finitely many 
in X finitely uh, many uh, Ziegel sets in D, uh, we are reduced Uh, to showing that um, uh, to show that uh, Yota composed with uh, phi tilde on um, uh, uh, um, sigma h to the n um, uh, is contained in finitely many Ziegel sets of x. So here you see something strange happen. It's not really clean. I don't like this proof. You get out of the, the pure domain, you just look at the norm. Because we don't understand enough uh, Ziegel sets in uh, G mod M. OK. So now uh, the trick is that uh, asymptotic Hodge theory does not tell you uh, how the variation degenerate on this, but only on very special sectors. But those sectors will cover ultimately uh, that space. So uh, let me define, uh, where is it? Let me uh, define, let sigma n. So this is where you really use the coordinates. You choose an order on the coordinates. So let sigma n be the set of z1, zn in hn, such that uh, the xi's are between 0 and 1, and y1 is strictly larger than, than yn, larger than 1. OK? So uh, these are uh, sectors. And you will notice that if you use all the permutations of the coordinates, then you will cover uh, sigma h to the n. Okay. So uh, what you are reduced to prove, uh, so what we want to show, uh, we want to show the theorem is that uh, there exists a basis E of uh, VQ and C larger than zero, such that for all Z in sigma n and then HZ, is EC reduced, right? So if you prove this, and if you remember uh, the first fact, this tells you exactly that uh, uh, Yota composed with phi of Z, which is this HZ, uh, is contained in a Ziegel set of X. So this is the analytic statement that uh, you are used to prove. And then using all permutations of the variable, you will get what you want. OK? All right. So uh, how do we do that? So this theorem implies everything. And you see this is just a, a statement about uh, the Hodge norm. So we don't use the full power of uh, SL2 orbit theorem. And here, this is kind of tricky. So the idea that we didn't know how to make, how to make work by restricting to curve, uh, ultimately here it will work. <coughs> so it will be an argument arguing only uh, on curves and using this. So uh, the proof is as follows. So let theta be the ring. And this is where you see that you need something more than pure minimality. You need a rate of growth at some point. So, and you take the ring of functions on uh, sigma n obtained uh, by pullback um, uh, via p from hn to delta star to the n uh, of real analytic function functions uh, on delta n. So what I'm saying is that you are allowed to use on sigma n any real analytic function coming from, uh, from uh, this. This we know because we know that this, this psi uh, will extend. So uh, then I will consider uh, the following ring. So this is a ring of polynomials 
in uh, the variable x1, xn. So now we do real analysis, y1, uh, yn. And then the inverse, y1 minus 1, yn minus 1, with coefficient in O. And now we call uh, OXY its fraction field. So it doesn't really affect the bracket independence of the O. Sorry? <laughs> the, the X and Y are algebraically independent. Yes. Yes. Uh, this I want to keep. And then I go there. And then uh, the claim is that I, can, I will restrict myself to uh, very nice functions, so, uh, which are uh, the following. So f in uh, this uh, fraction field is called roughly uh, monomial if f is equivalent to uh, y1 to the s1, yn to the sn for some integers si and it will call it will be called a uh, roughly polynomial if it is of the form uh, g mod h so this is a completely ad hoc uh, definition but it works uh, where g is in uh, o is in the ring and h is a roughly monomial So what is the use of those things? Why do we introduce those functions? Well, the point is that uh, those functions have the, the good idea that uh, you can test the rough uh, polynomiality on curves. So the lemma is that, uh, ah, I should, I should give you maybe the precise definition. Uh, yes, the equivalence is uh, where uh, f is, uh, uh, say to be uh, small, uh, smaller than g if there exists a constant such that uh, there exists c positive such that f is smaller than uh, cg and uh, f is equivalent to g if uh, f is strictly smaller than g and uh, g is strictly smaller than f. Well, it's not strictly smaller, it's much smaller and much smaller. Okay? This is a usual kind of equivalence. Uh, so the claim that makes the uh, proof uh, work is that if f is roughly polynomial and g is roughly a monomial, uh, then uh, the fact that f in absolute value is uh, much smaller than g on sigma n can be tested on algebraic curves. Can be tested. It is enough for this to be true for each curves by restricting two curves. Tau of the form uh, alpha one, you fix a certain number of variables and you take just a fine uh, equalities. So uh, you take those uh, affine planes, and uh, then for the remaining variables, uh, you just take constant. For alpha i larger than uh, in Q positive, and beta i in R. OK? So uh, this is a claim that I don't want to prove. Um, OK, but uh, what is nice is that the strategy that we didn't know how to make work uh, uh, geometrically, uh, it works uh, purely in the function theoretic terms. So now what are we reduced to? Well, we want to understand what is uh, the rough monomiality on the, or the rough uh, polynomiality of uh, this HZ. So the proposition, the proposition 
is that uh, for any uv in vc, then the function z gives hz of uv. So this is a function in oxy, where uh, z is x plus iy. Uh, and it is and is roughly a polynomial on uh, sigma n. And uh, so this is the first part in that if you restrict to the diagonal, so if you look at az of uh, uu, let me just write this, then this is roughly monomial. To some constant, uh, those zeta, z and 0 plus 1 is zeta and 0 plus 1, whereas these are, these are just constants. Okay. okay? And uh, this is uh, this proposition that follows from the Hoja symptotics described by uh, Kashiwara. So uh, now, uh, okay, I take uh, the few minutes that I have to conclude the proof. Uh, so how do you conclude? So now you want to uh, pr uh, finish the proof of this theorem that there exists a basis. So uh, and here I cannot do it. <laughs> because I need the asymptotic uh, decomposition. Uh, um, yeah, I think I will stop at this reduction, and then, uh, because otherwise it will take forever. And then uh, next time I will explain how you prove this proposition using uh, the asymptotic. Uh, I, I will uh, not take too much because I have many other things to say, so, but still. So I, stop, I think it's better to stop here for today and those interested in the details, then you have to look at the video of next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The questions? So, I have a question. Why are you restricted to the uh, symmetric space uh, given by the whole genome that suffice to show the, 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 the blackboard uh, behind yeah. them? It's just because I understand the Ziegel sets on X, but not really on D. Uh -huh. But you say we are reduced to show. Uh, yeah, you are reduced to show that this is con that is this yota composed with things. Just because if I know that I'm in finitely many Ziegel sets here, I know that the preimage of a Ziegel set here is contained in finitely many Ziegel sets. So if I prove the finiteness there, then I prove the finiteness there. You have you did not prove the definability of this. Uh, what you, you have to prove the definability of the of what? method. Uh, no, this embedding is definable. Uh, it's totally geodesic. Uh, okay, okay. So it's just it's the usual embedding of uh, this thing here. In the horizontal direction, OK? This comes, this comes from the general statement that I said, that uh, if you have a morphism of algebraic groups uh, inducing uh, such a map, then, uh, well, I shouldn't put this is not an embedding, but uh, um, in, inducing this morphism, then uh, it is definable. O already ob obvious. I mean, this is completely uh, semi algebraic. You just look at the definition, you take z, and you look at uh, the other norm corresponding to this. Okay. So, okay. This is a much weaker statement. The true statement is that the morphisms from S gamma GM to the associated uh, locally symmetric space is, is itself uh, definable, which is much stronger. Other questions? <laughs>